when I'm walking down the street. I do want to say to Donnie and many of you in this room that over a very long career in this city, all of you have helped me and my colleagues tell the truth and to try to tell. I may not look like you and you me, but I'm not so I just what does this event mean to you, Miss Peggy Mars? Oh, my heart. Happy 20th anniversary. My heart is about loving up on my sister. Do you know what it feels like to have your sisters in the room? Don. What you see in the flesh I'm free from people Free from myself There's The doctor lived next door to the janitor The janitor to the, to the reverend And the lawyer We were together Now we get so high and mighty That you create stress on your society Because you don't like poor black folks in you. That's a health problem Get yourself together So I can stop being taken care of geriatric people <laughs> First name's Donnie, last name's Glover. In it, the winner for the long haul, baby. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. My goodness, Friday, another week in the bag. Friday, October the 20th, and let's get the party started. Okay, today we will be speaking with a young man who works in the institutions. And I don't mean the institutions per se of higher learning. I do mean the institutions of incarceration. Now, the beautiful thing about this gentleman is we're going to welcome him to the show. Mr. Booker, good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm doing well. Good. We'd like to welcome you to the show. We're going to do the show via phone. We understand that there were some technical challenges. Tell us about yourself, Mark. Where do you come from? Well, uh, Donnie Glover, thank you so much for being here this morning, man. To God be the glory that we up one more day. Uh, I'm right here from Baltimore City, man. Grew up on the west side. Mm -hmm. What schools did you attend? Yeah, so uh, I uh, went to Grove Park Elementary School uh, right there at Chattisane, right there on the west side near Wabash Avenue. That's where I went to elementary school. Then I uh, eventually went to All Saints, which is on Liberty Heights, and uh, did my ninth grade studies at uh, Northwestern High School, Wildcats for a minute, but ultimately graduated from Cardinal Gibbons High School uh, in, uh, over there on the west side across from St. Agnes Hospital. It is now closed. All male uh, high school for uh, boys. Now, I'm going to take a stab at it and and put it out there. Was your mom a teacher or your dad? Uh, as a matter of fact, neither one. Uh, my mother worked for Social Security Administration. She's now retired. And my dad uh, was a U.S. postal worker. Was, okay. Well, somewhere along the line, someone reiterated the significance of education in your life. Amen to that. Yes, so, sir. Someone understood the score. You know what the score is, Mark? Talk to me. The score is this. My mother did it like this. It was around 1972. We were in East Baltimore. And I hope no one gets offended by this. But here's the score. Lily Glover gave me the score at about seven years old. She says, black is back. White is right and tan is grand. Mm. I don't think you can get the score any simpler than that. No, sir. Who taught you the score? My dad told me the score uh, and my mother. But my father said that 
uh, the ultimate equalizer is education and knowledge. And that the best thing that ever could be you could do for yourself, uh, which will be close number two to uh, being humble to the almighty creator is for you to get all of the education and learning that you can. And so while I was a student in Northwestern High School, uh, I played a lot, had a lot of fun. It was great. I was in a marching band and doing a number of things. But my father felt like that I was not prioritizing my grades, bringing in C's. And he said that was unacceptable. Subsequently, we're going to cut the plan down and you're going to, the score is going to be for you to increase those numbers at Cardinal Gibbons High School. That's what you're going to do. So he transferred me and I went to an all boys school and he stayed right in my space. Uh, coming to various meetings, keeping in contact with my instructors to make sure that all I needed to do was to keep my head down on my schoolwork. Where was your dad from? My dad is ultimately from Baltimore, Maryland. Did he go to Douglas High School? My dad uh, graduated from Douglas High School with his GED after he had his children, yes. I remember complaining to my dad somewhere around seven years old. You you getting there, buddy? You got you got to cut that camera on. Uh, saying to my dad, I said, uh, I, I asked him. Well, you know what? Let's take it that way. We'll we'll take it that way until you get your camera going. Put it back like you just had it. We had the icon up. We're gonna cut the phone off and let you try it that way. Okay. Okay. We're having some technical difficulties, having a, a bit of challenges, but we're gonna work this out. So, Mark, you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you All hear right. me? We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. All right. That at least leaves me a free hand to sip on my coffee a little more comfortably. <laughs> Very well. You don't see the camera button, though, huh? I do see the camera. It says one says stop cam, and then I see on the left hand says you're in the show. Everyone can see and hear you, but I don't see where they can see me because I don't see uh, it my own self. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna go with this. I I'm not gonna sweat it. That's all right. I appreciate to be here. We're gonna keep it moving. Yes. So now you keep on finagling. I. You get a nine one one call if you if you go off all the way. But um, I remember saying to my dad about uh, uh, around seven years old. I said, "Daddy, do you hate white people?" Mm. I used to ask. I, I I was very inquisitive as a kid. Okay. And he said, "I don't hate anybody." I'm seven years old, East Baltimore. So Lord knows what I had seen at that point. I knew my daddy was a funeral director. But I had heard and seen enough. I mean, this was 72, so this is four years after the riots. I had seen enough. I'd seen something that caused my little seven-year-old self to ask him, did he hate white people? And he said, I don't hate anybody. He said, I hate what some people do, but I don't hate anybody. Mm. Mark Booker, do you understand the impact of those words on a seven-year-old? The word of hate. No, he could have said, yeah, I hate white people. Uh, I, I do. So, at, of course, words mean a whole lot and have impressions upon individuals who have uh, youthful adolescent minds and what it is the adults say to us. And I think uh, the impact of my father, if I may, was that you are going to get your education. Now, I didn't necessarily know what that meant. And in my household, I didn't see degrees framed up and hanging around the house. I, I didn't go to any homecomings, predominantly white, or I didn't go to any HBCU homecomings. I, I didn't hear my father talk about class reunions. N none of that. I didn't see any yearbooks laying around. But all I do remember is my father always had a newspaper and magazines and books around. Impact. Yeah, Mark, I, I'm I'm 58. I guess you get, you you're younger than me, right? 
I'm older than you, Donnie Glover. I, I know that. I was just being polite. So, so, <laughs> so you you remember the riots more vividly than me. Well, I, I'll tell you this honestly speaking, man. I I do not even remember as a child when Dr. King, Malcolm, Megger, the DC riots. I do not remember that as a child at all, even though that was taking place when I was a very young boy. And I don't even remember my parents talking about it. So the magnitude of me being exposed to it wasn't until I was a student at Howard University and read about it. I do not have any memories whatsoever. My daddy had a funeral home, East Baltimore, and I remember the National Guard soldiers on our front. So mm -hmm. he could have not had an opinion, but you still got to explain why these soldiers out here standing where I normally am playing at. Riding, wow. my big, riding my big wheel. Then I remember Ooh. the tanks coming up North Avenue. They were right on top of the median strip. That's crazy. And I remember people taking coat hangers, affixing a ball of steel wool to the end of it, lighting it on fire, and then whirling them through the air. Mm. It was kind of like fireworks. Interesting. East Baltimore. East Baltimore. Well, you know, I'm a West Baltimore, even though I love the East and the West side, we would never have uh, any types of beefs, if you will, for the, you know, for the sake of uh, funniness. But yes, primarily much of my time was spent on the the west side a true hustler been to both sides down a true hustler got roots got connections got friends got a network all over baltimore amen and and the only ones who really hold on to that stigma have just never caught the daggone bus across town oh no i caught the bus across many towns man my family uh my uncles in fact taught me how to ride the MTA across town. I remember when bus fare was like 15 cents. Yeah, you remember the green card, the little green paper card they used to have, you could you flash that when you was catching the bus, that was the color of the bus cut ticket when you got ready to uh, get on the bus from school. That was, I had a green card uh, when I was going to Northwestern High School. But we had bus tickets. Yeah, bus tickets too, yes, bus tickets. Remember you used to have a pack of the bus tickets. Yep, I remember the little transfer. Yes, sir. Paper transfer. Paper transfer. Yes, sir. And the Super Sunday, 50 cents. All day. I tell you what, I tell you what, let me ask you this. Yes, sir. So when was your first experience with racism? First experience with racism. Oh, yes. How could I ever forget? You dare not ask me that and put me on the spot. I'm a student at Cardinal Gibbons High School. And the basketball coach at the time, I'm, I'm on JV and varsity practices together. JV and varsity practice together. And I remember when I was in the 10th grade, the head basketball coach at Cardinal Gibbons High School told me, said, Next year, when you're a junior, don't come out for the team. So I'm thinking to myself, it must be something to do with the academics. I said, uh, Coach, my grades are, are good. He said, no, nah, you, you, you're not going to make the team next year. Don't have anything to do with your grades. Don't come out. So I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Could you play? Yeah, I could play. Listen, I played, I mean, as a freshman, I made Northwestern, I made Northwestern's JV team as a freshman. Yearbook to prove it. Okay. Any of that. Okay, so, so it, I, wasn't, it wasn't your basketball. No, nah, no, nah, I had game. Now, nobody said I was going to the league or D1 or D2, D3 school, but I had high school game okay. as a young. Well, so when me, I, I'm, me, I'm, me, hold, hold, hold up, hold up. You played BNBL. No BNBL. Project Survival? Keep going. Where, where'd you get your experience? Howard Park, Grove Park. Okay. But you could you could beat the other people on it. You, you, you held your own. I mean, you make JV in the freshman year, 
that's impressive. Okay, so yes. so so he, he, he's getting to the questions because yeah, I, I yeah, can see you thinking. I can see you thinking strategically, like you taking taking this off the table, that off the table, and then it dawns on you. What happened? Yeah, so he gonna say, "Don't come out for the team." So I'm thinking to myself, he's not talking to me because if it has nothing to do with my academics, you need I need to have the 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 platform to demonstrate my skills to play. So when he tell me not to come out and let, tell me not to come out, I come out anyway. I don't care nothing about that. I'm not scared of the peer pressure. And he said it publicly. He said, you know, son, you don't need to come out next year because you're not going to make the team. Yeah, okay. I come out on the team and he cut me, but it was all right. It was all right because I had to let him know that you cannot discriminate to tell me that I can't come out. You haven't seen me play yet. So I get cut from varsity as a junior and I get cut from varsity as a senior. But in my mind, I made the team in my soul because I demonstrated my ability and I practiced with everybody else. So I stayed in shape, still got a chance to play basketball and I wasn't afraid of the peer pressure of individuals teasing me because I got cut. But yeah, that was my first experience of racism. I don't know. I I, I don't want him to fight. I, I mean, you ain't take your dad up to school like dad. Check, oh, yeah, G, G yeah, check I, I told, yeah I, I told pops about that, but I told him that was one we didn't need to go do that one necessarily. Uh, and and so he 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 was cool with that. You know, I, I wasn't even concerned about that one. He could have done you a favor. You could have been so good that you forgot. There you go. There you go. Oh my God, what was it? Oh yeah, you had the thing covered. <laughs> All right, we're going to let you in. All right, the Honorable. Salaamu Alaikum. Peace and blessings to you. Because you got Donnie fans Glover. all over this place, man. Donnie Glove is called Perseverance, baby. Yeah. That's all. And I was trying to give you customer service, too, because this is the platform that you would ask for, so I was still working on it. Yes, sir. Don't give up. Amen. All right, so, so Mark Booker, he may have done you a favor because – you may have been so good, you would have forgotten about your, your goal. I knew at 13 that I probably wasn't going to go to the pros. Okay. I knew at 13 that basketball was not going to be the vehicle that would take me to wherever the good Lord had for me to go. I understand. And so you learned, you learned relatively early, too. Yes, sir. I wasn't tripping. So when it was time for me, when I graduated from high school, I still had sports on my mind. I had baseball on my mind. I had basketball on my mind. And baseball, I asked, that's my sport. I actually asked the coach, uh, could in fact I walk on? He said, yeah, just come on. Let's see what, what your skills were. And I decided, I said, no, nah, let me go with the academics and left the ball alone. The same coach? No, this is when I went to Howard University, sir. Oh, Okay. So after I graduated from high school, I still had sports on my mind. Not necessarily whether I was going to go to the league, but I still had, I felt like I still had some run in me. Some potential. Potential. Now I went out on the basketball. I was at the YMCA yesterday. My God, this lady was looking from up on the stage, man, up on the uh, platform. They, the, the, the basketball court is kind of like down in a bowl, you know, window. I couldn't right. hit a layup to save my soul, man. Mm. I like a black <laughs> man that can't hit a layup. You know, that's wow. embarrassing. Yeah. I mean, all you had to do is use the glass, homeboy. I was, man. <laughs> you know, I wear glasses now. And all the, uh, it just it just reminded me of when I was a kid. Now, baseball, okay. much more astute. Some wow. people just got that natural, you know? Yes. i tell you something else that I've paid attention to. At what age we give a child, a young black boy in particular, a basketball? Mm -hmm. at, at, at what point does the basketball become like a book? I'm right. much more. I'm much more. I, I can. I, I, I can do more tricks with this than I can a basketball. That's true. As a matter of fact, I can even write one of these and put my name on it. Yes, you can. Amen to that. 
Matter of fact, I can do a behind the back and come up with a second book. Uh -oh. Bam! Uh -oh. watch, watch yourself, Donnie Glover. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. See, I, can that's, think, that's, I can think that with a basketball, but it just never. And I thank God for it because it wouldn't be two books. And Donnie, just think about that. You probably have in time while you probably sitting there on at least another 10 books of information that you could do collaborations you could do co-authoring individuals I, you know you've heard me say this before man i just want to say it for your listening audience man you are baltimore's john h johnson you you are our ebony magazine because it, it was john johnson that said that we need to talk about the perspective of african americans and at the time it was blacks and wasn't taking nothing away from Life Magazine, Time Magazine, and others. But the reality was, you know, he just had to keep it real at that area. And we love to see ourselves in the magazine. His subscription level was extremely high. Everybody had a copy or a subscription to Ebony Magazine. And if you didn't, you could buy it off the newsstand. And while and you were there, will not you just pick up a jet while you at it with the, 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 uh, the Ebony Magazine? So you do that for us. My dad had them Black Enterprises. Black Enterprise Magazine also. Show enough. Tell them about the story between those two, John Johnson and Earl Graves. Yes. And in, in Earl Graves' book, I remember reading it, um, and I can't tell you exactly what the page and chapter was, but Earl eloquently outlined his uh, his irritation to some extent with John in as much that when Earl Graves was putting together Black Enterprise Magazine, John Johnson, and I'm just paraphrasing from my interpretation from Earl's book, is that I'm covering Black economics, Black entrepreneurship, Black finance, Black money, Black businesses. I'm covering that in my, we don't need you to do that. And so at some point in time between the two of them, there was a, I'm just going to call it, there was a rift because John said, I have the material. Earl said, I'm coming. And at some point in time, they did heal. But but John felt as though that, they, that the media or that the audience didn't need to have a second one or a book that was covering, a magazine that was covering that. And why should... Uh, how to succeed in business with acting white and Earl's book addresses the issue that he and John didn't get along in the early stages, but at some point in time they did heal. Because think about it, you got two titans. Two titans, but also two magazines capturing aspects of the black experience, and you want them to be uniquely different. And so Earl Graves went, went with the business aspect. Yes. Very right. important. I mean, that was that was quite visionary. Well, you go ahead and do, you know, the 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 because we all got Jet magazine for the uh what do you call it? We're gonna say a pop-up. The yeah. centerfold. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. I, I mean, let you say that the magazine, you just have who's the centerfold. You don't even buy the magazine. Who got the centerfold? <laughs> yes. But, but for those who wanted a mini a mini version of Ebony was Jet. I'm gonna just give you a quick snippet. Well, well that's really what I was thinking about. Jet. Yes. Ebony yes. took too long to get to the point. Jet. Boom. Yeah, but I think, and, and I'll just tell you this, uh, with all due respect, I probably have in my physical possession about 70 or 80 original copies of Ebony magazine. Collectors edition. You talk about black history written from the publisher, not an edition that was uh, that's been scanned. And I have the actual magazine. All right, so I want to get back. I, I, I want to get back to your dad. Yes, sir. Who told you? At what point did you see? Or did your dad talk about? Did your dad talk about the penitentiary? Yes, 
a very small level. He he talked to me about it as a way of threatening me to if you don't study, then that's where you're going to be. And that, that, that was all it was. If you don't if you don't study and if you don't concentrate your energy and efforts on reading and writing and understanding your multiple uh, your multiple cation tables, and you're not reading profusely newspapers and books outside of class, I guarantee you that you will be, yes, in somebody's prison. I had an uncle that had, what, three uncles on my dad's side. This one worked down the Jessup House of Corrections. And I'm about 13, 14. It couldn't have been that old. All I remember him saying, now I know he worked in the jail because he come in sometime with the blue corrections uniform on. I later come to understand that they call CO yes. correctional officer. Turnkey! Mm. Somebody out there, that ring, that, that let me let me say it again. A hey, turnkey. That's resonating with somebody out there, I know. Now That's I right. know you you probably don't even know that. Well, you probably may have gone. Turnkey, can I make a phone call? Yes, sir. Uncle Sammy said one thing. Don't come down here. Mm. He said, don't come down here because ain't nothing I can do for you. I'll tell you this here, Donnie, if, if I may just share that about that. I just want to say to Uncle Sam, he up in heaven now. I was a little early to be coming at me about don't go. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe he felt I needed to hear the message early. Mm. Thank you, Uncle Sammy. I cut you off. What you saying? No, no. I I'll tell you, uh, and my father's passed away now, such that I can't speak to him, but when, when your parents tell you some things that they're not like just tripping and making up stories. The first time Donnie Glove, Baltimore's own John Johnson magazine. I remember when my father told me, if you keep showing off, not having your academics where it needs to be and not take reading seriously, you're going to prison. I'm thinking like, come on, Dad. Like, I ain't committing any crimes. Like, no, so if I don't read a newspaper or a book, I'm going to jail or prison. Like, that's not making any sense. But guess what I found out years later? The first time that I taught students who were incarcerated, I saw my childhood friend there from the west side of Baltimore. We used to play together. And when we saw, when we saw each other on that day, we almost had rid of mortis in our soul. We stopped immediately and remember how we used to be playmates. And all I could remember was what happened to he and I's friendship. And our parents knew each other. We played bikes together. We played in the street together. Baseball, just running around. And what happened to him? And I didn't go there. Was it because he didn't read? I, 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 got a, I, got, I got a question for you about him. Now, you playmates, so you know generally his life, he knows generally your life. Was his father in his life? See, I don't remember. Ah, uh, did he know your father? Well, we know both know we had parents, but like we didn't come. See, in that day, we wasn't coming inside each other's house. We, our parents knew each other. We played outside from sun up to sun down. There was no need to be inside, so we wasn't coming around. But I'm going to say that oh, our your parents, mother knew. Your mother knew exactly who you knew. were with. Yeah, I think our parents did know each other, but you know, your, we your, mother, parents, your mother, your mother dropped down at some point. I don't want you down there playing with them no more. Some, that's, something that's happened where, where we get a little too close, and your mother said. I don't like you hanging with them. I don't like their mother. Your mother, she might have had a glass of wine. She started telling you all the skinny. I don't like her ass and then you leave her kids alone. They badass kids. I'm sorry. That's just how it happened. Right, in the hood. Right, right. Amen to that. You know, so-and-so was such and such. <laughs> and then you as a kid better not make the mistake of taking that information outside. Come on, man. You know your mother on welfare. Come on, what man. you say? <laughs> <laughs> you know your mother worked down in El Dorado. <laughs> oh, 
Watch yourself. It's going to be a fight. Just, just, hey, you talk too much. And then your parents realize you can't tell that boy nothing. Can't tell him anything. Mark Booker, what is the significance? Of, and now, with all due respect to our mothers. Yes. But we live in a community today. We used to be more married than any other ethnic group. Now, I'm going to need you to put that down. Treat us like you treat CNN, okay? Huh. 70% single mother households. Fathers, the, the fathers are MIA for whatever reason, good, bad, and different. When that boy turns 13 years old and is physically stronger than that mother, she ain't gonna tell him what to do. And she gonna have two choices, put him out or accept that he's the man of the house. A lot of these young men grow up with that mentality. I'm the man of the house. So at 14, he's slinging crack rock. Heron, cocaine, standing on the corner. Mm -hmm. Girl, boy, dimes, blue tops. Got a new pair of tennis shoes, give his mother $50. God forbid she ain't got a dope habit. Mm. What happens when the father's not in the house, Mark Booker? 70% single mother, black, single household, single member households headed by women, black women. In the black community 2023 in the 40s and 50s we used to outnumber we said there'd be more the percentage of black married people was higher than any other ethnic group the 40s the 50s this is the most oppressed people in america besides the indians who just got killed or given smallpox only to have a teacher like you had a cardinal gibbons to tell your child don't go out for the team Wherever he at, I hope he just fall in a damn. If he in a grave, I hope we could dig him up and bury him again. Throw some battery acid on him. Stealing dreams from children. Right. Come on, Mark Booker. What I, happens I, when I, the father's not in the house? I'm struggling with what happens when the father is not home because my daddy was home. And I'm the oldest of three boys such that that's the case oh you were the oldest and you were clowning yeah no but way. you didn't want to take on your responsibility Pops. Mm -mm. so he, here's what i think on the absence of the father that when and i'm i'm going to tell you that when i became 13 14 and i remember a little hair start trying to come down on my chin i could feel that my shoulders was trying to have a little boldness to it and my body was changing and sometimes my mother would say some things and at this time I'm, I'm a little taller than her at least close to her height I'm, I'm feeling myself but my father said no sir boy and when he said no sir that mean he got in my face and my father said I don't, I don't care about how many agencies out here that talk about child protective services but if you disrespect your mother in here or talk to her or get in her face and think you somebody and because you get a little older and your body changing a little bit, you get some height because you get a little hair in your face, it's going to be a problem. And that's not the word he used because I'm not going to use profanity. But he, he said, said I will, he said, I will F you up. He's going to whip that, going to whip that butt. And so I was fearful that he was the man and the father in that house and that my mother would let him know. And it was times when I talked back to her, he got in my face. So that, first of all, like I wasn't gonna cross, anytime I thought like I was gonna do that, it's gonna be a problem. Did so he have I, a ring on that on that wedding finger? He did. You ever catch one of them back? I mean, I was sitting right here and that thing came, I'm running my mouth. Bruce Lee ain't had, you know, I hear Eddie Murphy talk about his mother with the flip-flop and his doc had this whop up, whop up. Remember Bruce Lee? Whoa! I do. I do. I do. Next thing you know, you like, did I just feel metal yes. on my tooth? Yeah. So my father gave spankers. He ain't, he didn't he didn't do none of that hand stuff. He but and I mean I got plenty of them. Uh, I probably got more than I think that he should have gave me, but you know, I bless his soul. He saved he, me a life. I, I tell you what, if, how, much, if he how much time doing, did you do in the penitentiary? Me? Yeah. Zero. Same here. 
So See, I think if, if, you, if the father don't put the fear of God yeah. in in his yeah. child, yes, you leave it for the CEO and the five O. Listen, man, here's the real story. If you don't put your hand on your put your hand on your child, and I'm not necessarily talking all physical, but if you don't get in your child's face, you leave it to the criminal justice system to do it. It's only one or two things because it's gonna happen. So if they if they're not listening at home, they're not gonna listen in the street. And when it's time to get ready to get in the street, the system will put their hands on you. The street system and the criminal justice system will put their hands on them. And so as a consequence, my father taught me at an early age about peer pressure. Now, you either can do what I tell you or listen to them in the street. Now, what you going to do? And there was times where I was like, you know, I'm going to come in a little late. I'm going to test it. Yeah, I remember one day I got in just a little bit after it got dark. My father was sitting on the front steps at 3811 North Rogers Avenue off of Liberty Heights, right smack in between Wabash Avenue and Liberty Heights. And when I walked up to that house, he was sitting on the front steps by himself. And he wasn't chilling with a newspaper, just enjoying the breeze. He was waiting for me. And I could, as I was coming up the street, I start sweating. I, I could feel him. And all I'm going to tell you is, bro, never did I come home ever late again. And that was the transformation of my peer pressure. Tell a fellas no or deal with dad. Now, so what happens after you become a grown man and dad not there? I was already trained like, okay, yeah, I'm going to roll with the fellas, but not today. It didn't bother me as I got older to, 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 not, to tell the fellas no. Didn't. Because something is still etched in me now. That when you got to tell the fellas no, it's easy. But we have to have fathers that have presence to tell boys no, and I'm so glad, wishing the fact that my father was still living, but he served the time that God needed him to be here. I'm so thankful, Donnie, that he he told me no. And times he had irritated me that I wanted to be with the fella so bad. Oh, my goodness. I wanted to hang on the streets. It was something about seeing the fellas on the corner at 9.30 at night or 10 o'clock at night or just when it was dark. It seemed like there was a certain manhood. They was getting something going on and I wanted to find out what was that? It was called Thunderbird and Pineapple Juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thunderbird and Pineapple Juice. Yeah. So so fathers have to be more present because we which, have to Which have would eventually be a problem because the people who accept who sipped that pineapple, that Thunderbird pineapple juice, they had a different trajectory. <laughs> they weren't going where your father wanted you to go. They, they, Somebody didn't have a vision for them that your parents, you know, the same vision that your parents had for you. Yeah. It's a choice I, out here. It's life and it's death. Those cats... I thought I was being deprived by, that I couldn't hang out on the corner because I didn't see. I didn't see as a thirteen-year-old or fourteen or twelve, <laughs> even fifteen. I, I didn't see that. Like if I didn't see them standing on the corner, that that was harmful. You didn't see I the just, connection. No, I just thought that they were just having fun after dark and just like they were. They were laughing. They were talking, and anytime they wanted to be on the corner. I didn't see them doing that either necessarily. Somebody uh, had some weed. Somebody had some Listen, listen, I now know as an adult that hanging out on the corners was only in front of the liquor stores. So I now know what that was. And but it was a I, song. It was a song. Woo woo. Yeah, they were doo whopping at the time. But do wop. Yes, yeah, I thought that they were having so much fun that I wanted to be there, not knowing what that influence was. But my father knew. So fathers being present has to have strong relationship between mom and dad. Fathers being home have to be have to say even if it's a beef between them, I still need to stay home. Fathers need to know that 
we must have patience to stick around anyway in spite of the condition. Even if your soul is hurt because you're not the breadwinner anymore, you got to stay. If you got kids, you just got to stay. Or if you're no longer in a relationship with that woman, you still have to be in that child's life. Got to be in a child's life. As much as you can. You must. As much as you can. Otherwise, you could be looking forward to some visitations over the jail. And now the system is so insidious. They want to lock you up, the father, if you don't pay child support or take your license or deprive you of some other freedom. And then, yeah. so let's go to this lady's question. We're going to get to it. Uh, damn, the show damn near over. It ain't my fault. Uh, we had to bring you back. Okay, uh, let's get to this lady's question. So black women are the fastest growing... You teach at you, you teach education at the at the at the cut. I do. College education. Students at Bowie State University prison education program. I'm one of the lead professors at Jessup Correctional Institute. Okay. Teach. So we know that black men, America has five percent of the world's population, 25% of the world's inmates. Half of them are us, black men, with black women being the fastest growing demographic. So uh, this young lady's question, is there a difference? And then also half time the father isn't there because of mass incarceration. Uh, do you encounter this scenario of, the, of women inmates? Very little. Uh, I will tell you that I, at the MCIW, Maryland uh, Correctional Institute for, Institution for Women, uh, that I'm a volunteer in their book club, um, but I don't teach actually there. I think part of is there any educational barriers difference between men and women in prison is that because there's so many men in prison and we have so many correctional institutions where men are incarcerated it just happens to be the priority and i think it's a it's a it's terrible uh that there's not more education for women even though it's less prisons so i think that uh is there a difference in the educational burden probably because i think that women uh, crave the rigor and adjust themselves around academics different from men. Uh, we, as young boys and men, we have probably played too much in school and didn't get the basis. Whereas women, I think they study differently. So I don't think there are any, uh, I don't think that there are any. Also, society is more accepting of the black woman. Who wouldn't want a black woman working in their business? But you, Oh, you're a threat. Mm -hmm. Understand. And you got a degree too. Not only are you gonna take my business, you're gonna take my family. You yes. educated yes. black man, you are a threat. Be not mistaken. And the only way I'm gonna let you in is you gotta show that you're 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 non-threatening. I'm gonna need your voice to sound a little differently than those guys on the corner. Uh you have to tone that bop down. You know what a bop is. Yeah. And so then a black man is all discombobulated and find himself reading all kinds of revolutionary books and going to the library because he's just trying to find out who he is. And then he run across the likes of a W.E.B. Du Bois. Come on now. Talking about the souls of black folk. And then you come to realize that your experience in 2023 is not much different than his experience in 1923. Two souls, two strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dog and strength alone keeps us from being torn asunder. Or you might read some Frederick Douglass. Come on, come on down and talk and about you read that I'd rather be who I am, a black man. Or, or some Malcolm X, some come Frederick on. Douglass. And some... Or some Constance Baker Motley. Or Ella Baker. Yeah, them two. Rose Shirley Chisholm. Yes, sir. Mary McLeod Bethune. Our Vice President, Kamala Harris. Ah, okay, we don't have to go there. I'm just saying, I'm adding her to the I'm list. Let me tell you what the streets say. The streets say she got to where she is locking up black people. So here we talk about mass incarceration. But let me tell you, I had a conversation with a cop friend of mine. Okay. Five years, four years ago. I was so mad with him at what he said. He said, we got to build more prisons.
Look at Baltimore today. Was he right? Four years ago, he said you had to build more prisons. Joe so Carter don't want to give him no time. Other people say lock him up. How you gonna feel when you behind the barrel of that 38, that 357, that that Mac, Mac 11, that 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 AR with a little kid ain't old enough to wash his own hind parts? Talking about give me your money. What you think should happen to him? I'm gonna answer with a long answer if I may. All right, sure, sure. I think we I think I think Donnie, honestly speaking, that we need to go back to John Johnson's magazine. I wish I had it in front of me right now. He wrote a, a, a full, a full spread article on guess what? Black on black crime. He discussed it thoroughly in that book. I think we as a community need to look at that. You still there? Yeah, I, I was just listening to you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we I think we need to take a look at his his material. And he did a full spread and a concentration on the front cover, black on black crime. Like, how is it that I keep putting my hands on you, Donnie? Why well, keep doing that? What is the issue that we keep putting our hands on each other? <clears throat> it's called self-hate. It's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire. Okay. It's called Franz Fanon's uh, uh, Wretched of the Earth. Yes, the sir. The colonialization mindset where we think the white man's ice is colder. We think anything a black man got is inferior because that's what the society projects on us. And certainly when it comes to history, black people didn't create anything. Certainly black people didn't invent medicine and astronomy and uh, mm -hmm. science and algebra. Certainly that came from Greeks, certainly when you go to college, young man, you I'm not going to train you to be in an African fraternity. I'm going to teach you to deny your blackness so much you want to be calling yourself Greek. Point well taken. I don't look Greek, bro. And that's why I never pledge, with all due respect. I understand. I'm I'm an African. I ain't mm -hmm. putting no funny looking letters. It ain't my letters anyway. You stole them. That's understandable. The 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 triangle, where the hell you think it come from? Uh, then you put a new you put a new word on it. It's delta, and I ain't talking about the delta the sorority. I'm just talking about that's change. That's what that triangle is. Change. Point well taken. And I took don't think any our symbols and renamed them, and now and that and that's that pedagogy of the oppressed. So it's why do you not expect this thirteen year old to steal your kid? No, but I'm I'm not going to fully blame it on systemic self self fulfilling prophecy. I'm not going to blame it on total systemic self fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to talk about it from a local perspective. That if I should see you today. At Lexington Market. If I should see you today at Lexington Market and you make a mistake and step on my shoes, you step on my foot, and you don't say excuse me. What kind of shoes you got on though? Anything. You step on my foot. Forget about the type of shoe. Timberlands, if you want to, Jordans, I don't know, whatever's the latest. New Balance. What? You step on my foot. Us some damn I'm, rubber gators, like four, five hundred, yeah. six hundred. 700, 800. Okay, I, I don't wear those, but I feel you. But if you step on my foot and you don't say, excuse me, and we both eye each other, acknowledging the fact that you stepped on my foot and didn't say, excuse me, and you walked away. And the public saw me receive you in such a way. Wasn't my heart embarrassed so bad that I had to put my hands on you and knock you out in Lexington Market? Where is the self-fulfilling prophecy of the mindset of the oppressed in that behavior that i had to do that to you i'm disagreeing with that from some perspective no i should know better than to have to do that but my soul said i'm embarrassed in front of everybody so now i gotta take you down i'm saying to you that that's levels of self-accountability that has nothing to do with systemic oppression nothing in my mind 
Because all we're going to say that is that. That cat knew he was wrong when he stepped on your foot. He knew there was going to be a consequences, and he was rolling the dice. He was betting that you wasn't going to swing on him. And I'm sorry, from North Avenue, he'd have had to catch some hands. Try Jesus. So no, no John. And then, you ever hear that song? So, yeah, so, but in that. But Try in Jesus. But in that, it's survival, man. Because if you let one in, you will let another in. But but now at the consequence of going to prison. I didn't say I that. My, I didn't say that. A, a, a batter gets you justice, a gun to get you time. That's what they taught me growing up. I'm just but, saying. But, but my so, daddy was an undertaker. So we already know once you up on that slab, that's permanent. It ain't no getting off that slab. It ain't no I'm sorry. You're dead. That person right. is dead. You took and you went to Sunday school. You ain't stay long, but you at least read thou shalt not kill. You read it. Somebody told you. You knew you was wrong when you put that clip in that gun and practicing like you was on TV, turn the gun sideways and all that stuff. You're going to jail, son, and you're going to be there until you pay for that crime. I know a cat that was locked up 42 years. Wasn't no subway when he went away. Mm hmm Wasn't no black mares when he went away. Now look at us. What do we do, Mark? How do we keep our how do we reverse this this cycle? And I know we only got a couple of minutes, but we can I stay think, as long as you like. I how think, do we think, reverse this mass incarceration? America has five percent of the world's inmates, 25 percent, uh five percent of the world's population, but 25 percent of the world's inmates. We got as many inmates as China. China's five, six times bigger than America. Yeah, How do we got as many inmates as them? And then we have the audacity to call the Chinese, the Russians, oh, they're communists. <clears throat> Muhammad Ali said, ain't no Viet Cong ever called me the N-word. Right. Yeah, I, I think, um, I don't, let me Would say Would you it. die for this country, man? Say it again. Would you die for this country? What do you mean by that? Would you go to war? I'm already in war. Every day I get up and, and put my clothes on and, and, and think about how I can be the change that I want to see. I'm at war. I don't need to put on a military uniform to do that. I'm in war. Every day that I get up and think about how many situations that our communities need to improve, I'm already at war. When I get up in the morning and I get up and go to work and put on my clothes, that's my uniform. I'm going to war. At any given point in time, I can step outside, God be uh, forgiven that that does not happen to me. But, you know, I can walk across the street and something could happen. I, I could get a, a, a straight bullet. I, of course, I don't want that to happen. But I, I'm at war. It's dangerous in our communities and the work that we do. So I, I make that point to say that you don't have to have a gun in your hand and put on a uniform to do that. With all due respect to those that do protect our country, I'm glad about that. But I don't think that's my calling, and neither is that my assignment to do that. I believe. That, yes, go right ahead. What do you believe? So I don't think my assignment is to do that. I think that my assignment is to do what my parents taught me to do, which was to read and write and pass that on to others. And that I do think that education, in my opinion, is a panacea. Your knowledge, your information, how it is that you control your thinking, to do as much as you can to be influencing others in the thinking, which is I'm glad that I have the opportunity to have taught individuals who are incarcerated. When you think about the school to prison pipeline, well, what happens after they get in the pipeline and they land in prison? Do they deserve to have academics and education? Does higher education play a role in individuals' transformational behavior when they leave? Does higher education in prison play a transformative role while they're in prison that deals with the culture of prison behavior. So I see myself, if you will, Donnie, and I'm not really in the labels as a prison educationist. How is it that we use education to transform the minds of individuals who are incarcerated? And so I think that to answer your question is that higher education is the right thing 
W-R-I-T-E is the right thing to transform a different kind of sentence. You know why you say W-R? Oh, the right thing. W-R-I-T-E, right yeah, thing. The right thing. Give them the opportunity to read, write, and compute. What's your favorite book, Mark? Ah, oh, boy. Right now, my favorite book is uh, Groundwork. Uh, Groundwork is the biography of Charles Hamilton Houston. And in that book... Now, every Baltimorean should know who Charles Hamilton Houston is, right? Charles Hamilton Houston is the former dean at Howard University, who was the mentor of Thurgood Marshall. He was a student. Thurgood Marshall was Charles Hamilton Houston's student at Howard University, and Charles Hamilton Houston was the mentor that didn't ask Thurgood what you think, he told him what to do. That's that's the, that's the That groundwork is the blueprint of what's necessary to tell us to go to the next level. This was Brown versus Board of Education? May 17th, 1954. Yes, Why would sir. I look at you, I think of the movie Glory, man. I don't know. You like, I see you know movies, I don't know. But it did, but it was him. It was Thurgood Marshall, man. So the groundwork was, it's not the Thurgood Marshall always story. It was what Charles Hamilton Houston told Thurgood Marshall to do. And he did that. He went before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court where it was all white males at the time. And he had his briefcase with his suit. And he went in the court with the rest of George E.C. Hayes and Scott Wood Robinson and all the work that others had put in, James Nabry. And when they came out that day on May 17th, 1954, because they had used science, transformative, that education. Panacea. Donnie Glover, I, I love you, man, the fact that you allowed me just to come out here and hang out with you a little bit. Keep bringing the media, man. We need you. We need you. Did you have a favorite poem growing up? That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, I did not, but most recently, my favorite poem, and I don't even know it all the way, all the words, but it's Bridge Build. You want to share some of it? Oh, man, going along. Came back the evening, called the way to a castle vast and wide. He says, good friend, I am building this bridge for him. So that, that's the short of it, given our time. But that's my favorite poem, Bridge Book. Oh, we control this time. I'll just let you know. This is the internet. We can stay as long as we want. I respect your schedule. But but look like the, the government or somebody, the three-letter people, yeah. have started that's that's the We got all kinds of technical. You mentioned Charles Hamlet and Houston. Wow. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the hoodsmen been gone crazy. But it's all good. I, th no I think, I think you, 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 didn't, you didn't tap them enough. This, this well, gentleman, I'm on my, as a matter of fact, Donnie, I'm on my, this I'm on my way to there. a meeting now. Yeah, I'm on my way now to a meeting at, uh, for prison... At, the prison education that's going to start in one hour. So right. uh, I'm looking forward to coming back again if I may. Yeah, on a different computer. We're going to have to send you to one of our safe houses. This isn't the first time this has happened. How about that, that? Uh, have, hey, have, have, we've, we've had three letter forces try to mess up our flow, but you can't stop this, homie. All right, anyway, Mark Booker, we appreciate you. Shout out to all of the people who have watched. And uh, have a safe weekend. Good morning. You do the same, Donnie Glover. Be safe. Thanks a lot. Appreciate you, man. Yes, sir.